This is lecture number five of six on the storyline of the Bible by Dr. Dave Mathewson. In this lecture, he will be treating the epistles of Paul and tracing the five major themes of land, covenant, temple, his people, and kingship through the Pauline epistles. And now, Dr. Dave Mathewson. We've been looking at the what I call the storyline of the Bible, or kind of the underlying narrative that uh, narrates God's redemptive dealing with humanity and the entire cosmos uh, in fulfillment of his original intention for creation back in Genesis 1 and 2. And uh, we have looked at that in terms of five interrelated themes, the theme of people of God, uh, the theme of covenant, the theme of creation and land, uh, the theme of temple, and the theme of kingship. And uh, we looked at how those got developed in the Old Testament. Uh, the last lecture, we looked at how those themes get climaxed and fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, focusing particularly on how these themes emerge in the Gospels and how Christ brings them to fulfillment. Uh, what we want to do today is uh, look beyond the Gospels and see how those themes uh, continue to surface and, and wind their way through the remainder of the New Testament, finding their ultimate climax and fulfillment in the, the vision of eschatological salvation in Revelation 21 and 22. And again, I want to remind you that as we think about the story and how the story gets fulfilled, is uh, we need to draw two sets of distinctions. The first one is, uh, is between how these get fulfilled in Christ, that Christ is the key to the fulfillment of, uh, of the, these promises, of these uh, main themes and elements of the storyline, and that, but second, that these themes by extension also get fulfilled in the people who belong to Christ and who are incorporated into Christ through faith. So first of all, they get fulfilled in Christ, and secondarily, they get fulfilled in God's people who belong to him. The second distinction we need to make is between uh, the fact, between the inaugurated fulfillment of these uh, promises and of these themes and the consummated fulfillment. We said the, the eschatological tension between uh, what scholars often call the already but not yet or inaugurated eschatology and consummated eschatology uh, also affects these five themes. So initially they get inaugurated in the already part of this tension through Christ and his followers, the church, but in the future, uh, at the time theologians call the second coming of Christ, these at, at the very end of history, uh, the time when uh, Christ inaugurates a, a, a brand new creation, then these themes find their consummated fulfillment, the already side of this tension. So today we'll look at, continue to look at both the already aspect, especially focusing on uh, God's people, the church, and how these five themes get fulfilled, but also ending with the, the not yet aspect, the eschatological consummation and finale in Revelation 21 and 22, where we will see that these five themes all emerge. Starting then with the book of Acts, following from the Gospels, uh, what I want to show to you is, is this story continues through the book of Acts. Uh, for Acts, I'm not going to necessarily isolate the five themes in separation, but just very briefly look at uh, particularly the beginning chapters of Acts, but also kind of look, folk, looking at Acts as a whole, and just to see how this story that begins back in creation, in the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, now continues to exercise influence in Acts. And again, I'd remind you, I, I, I don't want to say that the main burden of every New Testament author is to explicate these five themes, but uh, at the very least to suggest that they assume this story. Uh, they assume the continuation of this story that uh, starts back in Genesis, goes through the New Testament into the life of Christ, and now uh, continues to uh, weave its way through the rest of the New Testament authors. So starting with the book of Acts, the place to begin is with, uh, that I want to begin anyway, is with Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It's intriguing that in verse 6, uh, Jesus' followers uh, ask the question, Lord, is it at this time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, so uh, clearly they are still expecting the, the ultimate fulfillment of the promises 
that uh, the prophetic text end with in, in the Old Testament. And now, in my opinion, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is, is a response to that question, in a sense, when Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what I want to emphasize about this verse is that it's, it's far more than a missionary strategy for how to do evangelism, starting with your home area and then spreading out. However true that may be, uh, that's not primary, primarily what Acts 1.8 is about. Acts 1.8, actually, all those phrases resonate with texts from the book of Isaiah. So the Isaiah's promise of restoration, where God will restore his people, his kingdom, under a Davidic king, in a new covenant, in a new creation, Isaiah's promise of restoration is now seen as beginning to be fulfilled in the book of Acts. And this text, which Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in a sense, uh, provides the introduction to the entire book, uh, not just an outline form, but theologically, in that the rest of Acts is going to, in one sense, be about how, how Isaiah's promise of restoration, how this Old Testament story that, that uh, goes all the way back to creation, in fact, now is fulfilled in Jesus' followers in the, the spread of the church and the spread of the gospel. So, for example, the, the mention of receiving the Spirit, when Jesus tells them, you will receive the Holy Spirit, that comes out of Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 15. Uh, the fact that they are to, when Jesus says, you are to be my witnesses, the witness theme, again, comes out of the book of Isaiah, where Israel was to be God's witness. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10 and verse 12 as well. And the fact that eventually this task of the disciples was to reach the end of the earth, this witness was to reach the ends of the earth, again, reflects Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6, that uh, the, the kingdom would eventually spread and this witness would go out to the ends of the earth, ultimately. So that uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, as kind of a programmatic statement for the rest of Acts, is tied closely to Isaiah's promise of restoration from the Old Testament. But more, more than that is notice the mention, too, of Samaria and Jerusalem. When Jesus says, you will begin, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria. Now, now why, does, why does the author mention Samaria? Why did Jesus tell them to start with Jer Jerusalem and then also include Samaria? Because what is going on here is now Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, and now Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel, are being united and restored in fulfillment of the prophetic expectation. So Israel is now being restored in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, so that the salvation can now go to the ends of the earth in fulfillment of Isaiah's program of restoration, but also in fulfillment of God's original intention for filling the whole earth with his glory and his presence and his rule in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. So already in chapter 1, uh, the, the author uh, sounds the, the notes of this storyline that we've seen goes all the way back to creation and weaves its way through the New Testament and uh, emerging especially in prophetic literature. In chapter 2, we find more indications of the author's intention to, uh, to link the, his story in Acts with the Old Testament story. In Acts chapter 2, for example, we, we, uh, it, when you read Peter's speech in response to accusations as, as to what was going on in the day of Pentecost, in the beginning uh, chapter of Acts, when the Holy Spirit is poured out in God's people, is in response to that, in Peter's speech, uh, read chapter 2 sometime and notice how many times David's name is evoked. Notice how many times the situation is linked with text linked to the Davidic king. So now the Davidic king has been restored. The, the, uh, the promise of God to David uh, found in the Old Testament going all the way back to 2 Samuel 7, which we said ultimately goes back to God's intention for creation in Genesis 1 and 2, is now underway. 
So the restoration is underway. But we, we find more indications of, of themes of, re, of people of God, temple imagery, new covenant imagery in chapter 2. For example, I used to always puzzle why, why towards the end of Acts chapter 1, why did the church see it necessary to appoint another disciple in the concluding verses of, of uh, chapter 1? Why did, why did they see it necessary? Uh, it's, it's almost here suggested incidentally in the story of God's Spirit being poured out in the people the day of Pentecost and the church's mandate to, to uh, be his witnesses to, to the ends of the earth. Why do you have, the, again, this story of, of the church choosing a successor a disciple who would be the twelfth one. If you remember, Judas uh, defected back in the Gospels, and so now the church chooses a twelfth. Why do they do that? Probably because, again, the number twelve is significant. That is, the reason they needed twelve disciples or uh, twelve apostles was because that was emblematic of the twelve tribes of Israel or the people of God. So by choosing, by choosing apostle number twelve, at the end of chapter 1 of Acts, again, the author is saying the, the people of God are being restored. The foundation, the, the, the restoration of Israel is underway by choosing the 12th and establishing the, the, the foundation of the new people of God in the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. So I, I, I think that explains why the Luke sees it necessary to narrate the event of choosing a 12th disciple as indicating here's the restoration of God's people. Here's the, the, the new people of God founded on the 12 apostles. This is the, the, the true restoration of God's people. But notice the other themes found in Acts chapter 2, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 suggests the promise of the new covenant. If you go back to the prophetic text, even all the way back to Ezekiel, uh, chapter 36 and 37, the new covenant was to be accompanied by and signaled by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a sign that God's new covenant has come upon his people. Uh, Greg Beale, in a couple of articles, has also argued that the pouring out of the Spirit on the people at the day of Pentecost suggests God's presence coming to reside and rest in his temple. Uh, so you have the temple theme in Acts chapter 2 as well, as long as, uh, along with the covenant theme and along with the restoration of Israel. Interestingly, too, the, the fact that you have all these persons making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, in preparation for the day of Pentecost and the pouring out of the Spirit uh, probably reflects the New Testament or the Old Testament prophetic expectation that we saw in texts like Ezekiel and Isaiah of the, the pilgrimage of the people or the return from the people of the people from exile back to their homeland. And then that is accompanied then by the, the rule of the Davidic king and the pouring out of the spirit, the new covenant, uh, God's presence with his people. So that uh, Richard Baucom could, could uh, claim in uh, one of his recent books, he could claim that Pentecost may be not so much the birthday of the church as the beginning of the restoration of the diaspora. That is, all of God's people scattered because of exile are now restored. So here's the beginning, the, the already stages of the restoration of Israel, of the restoration of God's people. A couple of other interesting notes is that throughout Acts, you also find these uh, kind of updates or notices that uh, frequently after certain events are narrated, a, a little caption that uh, describes and the church grew and increased a number or, or, or uh, many disciples were added to their number, uh, especially, for example, chapter 6 of Acts, uh, chapter 6 and verses 1 and 7. Verse 1 says, Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, and verse 7, the word of God continued to spread, the number of the disciples increased greatly. And chapter 9 also, and verse 31, 
Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in number. I, pr- I think that that phrase, that emphasis on growing and, and increasing, is a reflection of God's original intention for humanity back in Genesis 1 and 2, that they would be fruitful and multiply, that they would increase and fill the earth with, uh, with other image-bearing offspring. It probably also picks up uh, then the theme, too, of, of Abraham's offspring being numerous, the, the, the Israelites increasing at the Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, so that uh, once again here we find that the, the intention of God for the restoration of his people, where they, they, Abraham's seed would be numerous, where they would increase and multiply in fulfillment of God's mandate in creation, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, to be fruitful and multiply, now is being realized and fulfilled in the book of Acts. So that Acts chapter 28 ends at the heel of a series of, of lengthy missionary journeys of Paul that, uh, that, that broaden out so that Paul ends in Rome, is through the missionary journeys of Paul. And Acts chapter 28 ends with the gospel reaching Rome, and you have Paul still preaching the kingdom of God. So what's going on in Acts, again, is in the first couple chapters, the people of God, Israel, is being restored the temple is being restored with God dwelling in his, with his people. A new covenant is realized. Uh, uh, King David is ruling over his people. And now that that has taken place, salvation can go to the ends of the earth. Uh, in fulfillment of Acts 1.8, in fulfillment of the, the story that we've looked at. So that Acts ends with the story on its way to realization as the gospel reaches out in a sense to the ends of the earth. Uh, the the Roman Empire in Acts chapter 28. So now uh, now that this has taken place, now that Israel has been restored, and that part of the story has has now begun to reach a resolution, now the broader resolution of the gospel going out and God's kingdom and rule encompassing the entire earth can now take place as well. There are a number of other things in Acts that we could probably look at. But I, again, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how even Acts is, is a continuation of the storyline. It's far more than just the establishment of the early church and how the early church began to spread the gospel. Yes, that's true, but it's, it's to be seen as the, the, the continuing stages that begin in Luke uh, and the other gospels, the continuing stages of the fulfillment of the story that goes all the way back to creation. One of the most significant figures in Acts is the Apostle Paul. So in a sense, Acts provides a fitting introduction to the rest of the New Testament because some of the main figures uh, in Acts now feature, their, their letters and their writings, writings feature in the rest of the New Testament. And one of the dominant figures since the early chapters of Acts who soon comes to, in a sense, dominate the rest of the scene is Paul. So I want to look at the Paul's writings and to demonstrate how uh, particularly these five themes uh, of this story surface in Paul. Uh, again, we're primarily looking at the already, the inaugurated aspect. We'll, we'll primarily look at the, how these themes are fulfilled in the people themselves in the church, but also uh, we'll continue to see how for even Paul they continue to, they, they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ himself. So let's start with the people of God. The theme of people of God and Paul is, is obviously going to be found in places far beyond where he just mentions people of God or church or something like that. Uh, and what I have in mind is, is uh, the number of times throughout Paul's letters where the church, God's people, is seen to participate in the promises that are made to Israel, uh, particularly the promises of the new covenant. As we're going to see, all of the promises of salvation that God's people enjoy, that Christians participate in, are linked inextricably to the new covenant. Uh, there, there is no salvation outside of the new covenant that God makes with his people. So Jesus, we saw in the Gospels, inaugurates a new covenant. Paul now will continue to assume and articulate the presence of the new covenant 
and the blessings of salvation that flow from that uh, to, to God's people. So the, over and over, the church is seen to participate in the promises of, that were made to Israel, uh, particularly the, uh, connected with the new covenant, the, the, all the promises of salvation, the, the promises of the Holy Spirit. All, when, when we read about the references of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, being sealed with the Spirit, all that language connected with the Holy Spirit relates to the new covenant. We'll return to that in a moment. But a couple of other texts to focus on. One of the clearest ones is found in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 11 through 22 in particular. Uh, Paul says this, and what I want you to notice, too, is uh, much of this language that we're going to read of near and far, uh, uh, the language of preaching peace, this all comes out of Isaiah. So now, uh, even Paul sees the promises, the program of restoration in Isaiah as now being fulfilled in the church, which is made up of Jew and Gentile. So Paul says, therefore then, starting with verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2, Therefore, then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, that is, the Jews, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, language from Isaiah, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So even for Paul, Christ is the key to fulfilling the, the, the promises made to Israel. Christ is the, the climax of the story. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one, and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between them, by abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity, the creation, the new creation coming out of Isaiah, so that now he creates one new humanity in place of these two, making peace." And that he might reconcile both groups, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it, through the cross. So that he, so he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, both of us have the access to the one spirit or in one spirit to the Father. I'll stop right there because I'll return to the remaining two or three verses of this text later on. But uh, what you see here is clearly Paul assumes that the uniting of Jew and Gentile into one new humanity, into one new body, the church, is, is, is seen as the fulfillment of God's promises given to Isaiah or Isaiah's promises of restoration. So clearly uh, for Paul... Now we see God expressing his intention to establish his, reestablish and restore his people. A a new humanity consisting of Jew and Gentile. So that we already saw back in the Gospels with the coming of Christ who fulfills the destiny of Israel and God's people and, and is the key to fulfilling their story. Now membership in the people of God is no longer defined ethnically but now is defined solely in terms of relationship to Jesus Christ. So because Jesus Christ has come and through his death on the cross has accomplished peace, now membership or belonging to the people of God depends on uh, one's response to Jesus Christ. The, the people of God, constituted of Jew and Gentile, now revolves around faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, the p- new people of God are clearly being restored that are no longer eth- uh, defined along ethnic lines, but defined solely based on Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Uh, another key, uh, there are other texts that we could point to, but uh, uh, another instance, another key to understanding the, the church as the, the people of God uh, in continuity with the Old Testament people of God, the Old Testament Israel, is found also in the application of the new Exodus theme or motif uh, to the church. So, for example, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, 
Not to mention 10, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, where we see the church compared to Israel. Uh, but in chapter 5 and verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, I'll back up and uh, uh, let's see, I'll read, I'll read 7. Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, our Passover Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us, verse 8, Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, but the yeast of malice or evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Notice how much of that language comes right out of the Exodus narrative. So that, in a sense, what Paul is saying, a new Exodus has begun with Jesus now rescuing and delivering his people from sin and death and evil and restoring them as his people and delivering them just as he did with his people in the days of the Exodus. You, find, you also find Exodus language in uh, two other texts, Colossians chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Uh, again, that, that language of rescuing and redemption and purchase is reflective of the Exodus. So God, uh, uh, Paul clearly expresses here God's intention to, in a new Exodus, to rescue his people, to restore his people and, and bring them salvation in fulfillment of, of uh, the Exodus motif. Galatians chapter 4 and 1 through 7 also resonates with this Exodus uh, language in terms of, of redemption and rescue from slavery and sonship, Israel being, called, being God's son from the book of Exodus. So the first, uh, the, the first seven verses of, of uh, chapter 4 of Galatians, my point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons." And because you are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you are no longer slaves as the people in the days of the Exodus were, but now you are sons. And if a son, then also an heir through God. So clearly Paul is assuming the Exodus story and the Exodus language indicates in this text and the other text that God in a new Exodus is now restoring and, and saving and reconstituting his people, uh, which now is this transcultural group that we read about in Ephesians 2, made up of both Jew and Gentile based on their, their uh, relationship to Jesus Christ. So people of God, uh, 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 an important theme throughout Paul's writings where, again, he sees the people as the, the, the climax, the, the church made of Jew and Gentile, who, who are now recipients and participate in the promises of God from the Old Testament, are now the true people of God in fulfillment of God's intention that goes all the right way back to creation to establish a people that he would enter into a relationship and to dwell with. Which brings us to the next theme, the theme of covenant or new covenant. We saw that in the Old Testament, the prophetic texts ended with an anticipation of a new covenant that God would establish with his people uh, that we read about in, in uh, texts such as Ezekiel 37, 36, and 7, Jeremiah chapter 31. And now Paul either clearly mentions new covenant or, or also includes and highlights important new covenant themes. So, for example, as I've already said, the mention of the Holy Spirit. All throughout Paul's letters, I'm convinced whenever he mentions the Holy Spirit, underlying that is the assumption of the establishment of the new covenant. Uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit was one of the promises back in Ezekiel 36 and 37. The Holy Spirit was a new covenant promise. 
uh, the, the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts 2 in fulfillment of Joel chapter 2 is clearly linked with God's establishment of a new covenant with His people. So by, by emphasizing the covenant, the, the Holy Spirit, that we've, uh, again, you, Paul's language that we've been filled with the Spirit or baptized in the Spirit or sealed with the Spirit, Ephesians 1, or we, uh, other language of Christians uh, sharing with in the Spirit, receiving the Spirit, uh, that's not just uh, new Christian terminology, that is New Covenant terminology. So the presence of the Spirit with His people, uh, the possession of the Holy Spirit by the people, clearly evokes the New Covenant uh, idea from the Old Testament. Paul's mention whenever he talks about forgiveness of sins. Through Christ's death on the cross, we have forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is tied with the New Covenant. Ezekiel's language of God purifying us or giving us a new heart or removing our uncleanliness. Uh, The fact that our sins have been forgiven is one of the blessings of the new covenant. So whenever Paul talks about our sins being cleansed, removed, forgiven, uh, it's because of the new covenant. It assumes the establishment of the new covenant. Uh, One of the places where Paul clearly discusses a new covenant and relies on new covenant language and covenant language more generally is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and again, I will just read parts of this. Uh, I will not read the whole thing. But all throughout here, notice, notice the covenant language, notice the, the, the language from Ezekiel 36 and 37. So Paul says, are we beginning to commend ourselves? 2 Corinthians 3, again, surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? You yourselves are a letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with the ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, the new covenant Spirit, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart, reflecting this language from Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Our competence is from God who has made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant. Not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit, the new covenant spirit from Ezekiel gives life. So, so clearly Paul uses the language of new covenant, but again, his, his language assumes the covenant language and particularly the new covenant as found in Jeremiah and particularly in Ezekiel as, as uh, at the heart of Paul's ministry. He is the ministry, he is the minister of and dispenser of this new covenant uh, promised in the Old Testament. So uh, Paul envisions the restoration of God's people, a people that transcends uh, cultural or, or, or uh, national barriers to include all peoples by virtue of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul uh, understands, therefore, that the promise of restoration of people that goes all the way back to the Old Testament story and and to the book of Genesis, ultimately, is now underway. Uh, Along with that is the theme of covenant. If if the people have been restored, the covenant must be in force as well. And we, again, see hints in the language of Paul and in the, the... uh, many of the cons, theological concepts of the presence and inauguration of the new covenant. Davidic kingdom or kingship. Likewise, uh, Paul assumes and at times clearly articulates the promises of a Davidic kingdom in fulfillment of God's intention to rule over creation through his vice regent that goes back to Genesis, Paul sees that as being fulfilled, again, in the person of Jesus Christ, but also in his people. So, for example, there are places where Paul clearly understands Jesus as the fulfillment of the promises made to David. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, the gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. 
So clearly Paul links Jesus Christ with the, the physical lineage of David in fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7 and the prophetic expectation of a coming Davidic king. There's even some, some debate as to to what extent, whenever Jesus is referred to as Christ, some English translations may have Messiah, but most of ours will say Jesus Christ or the Christ or something like that. E- even in Paul's letters and other New Testament authors, when they refer to Jesus as the Christ, how much, how many of those instances are titles uh, as opposed to just Jesus' name or a proper name? Uh, there's some agreement that at least a lot of them that we've traditionally thought are just that's Jesus Christ, uh, that, that Christ still carry some of its titular force as, as Messiah, as, as king in fulfillment of the Davidic, uh, Davidic promises. But at the very least, Paul himself tells us in Romans 1.3 that Jesus is descendant of David. Elsewhere, even where Paul does not clearly call Jesus the Christ or the son of David or something like that and link him with the Davidic promises, there are other places where, where Paul clearly applies Davidic texts to the person of Christ. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, and I, I know I'm, I'm drawing on a number of texts uh, with, without talking much about the books as a whole or the context. Again, my, my point is simply to show you how pervasive these themes are in, in Paul's own uh, articulation of his message to his different churches. But Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 20 through 23 It says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things, which is the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What I want you to focus on is this language of Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of God and his dominion over all things and all his enemies under his feet. This language comes right out of Psalm 110 and Psalm 8. Psalm 110, a what is often labeled a, a royal or messianic psalm, describes the king, the, the messianic king, as... as uh, at the right hand of God, a position of, of power, a position granted him of authority. And now Jesus Christ is seen in his heavenly exaltation. Jesus' Davidic reign, his reign as King David on David's throne, has now begun by Jesus ascending to the right hand of God in fulfillment of Psalm 110. But intriguingly as well, to go back beyond Psalm 10 or Psalm 110, you remember Psalm chapter 8, uh, probably uh, most of us know that even better than Psalm 110. But in Psalm chapter 8, we read this. O Lord, our sovereign Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, is how it begins. And then you recognize, to skip down a couple of verses, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Clearly evoking Genesis 1 and 2, the creation. Or mortals that you care for them. Now listen to this. You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. That is, humanity is the climax of your creation. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. Genesis 1. You have put all things under their feet. Now Jesus Christ is seen as being exalted to heaven. In verse 22, God has put all things under Jesus' feet, under his feet in fulfillment of Psalm 8. So what's going on? Basically, Paul is saying, with the resurrection of Christ and his exaltation to heaven at the right hand of God, where he rules over all things and all things are under his feet, Jesus Christ has now entered into not only the Davidic rule and reign, but in fulfillment of Genesis 1 and 2, a reign that will spread God's rule over all creation in fulfillment of God's original intention of human- for humanity. That worldwide rule 
from Genesis 1 and 2 that was intended for Adam and Eve, but they failed at, and then was to be fulfilled through a Davidic king, has now been inaugurated through the res death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his exaltation to heaven. There are other indications, too, of uh, not only the Davidic uh, uh, kingship motif, but also the, the kingship motif in general that goes back to creation. Uh, what about the image of God's, uh, what about the, the uh, notion of God's image, that he created human beings in his own image as, as reflecting God, as representing God, and representing God's glory and rule throughout all of creation? In a couple books later, in the book of Colossians, in the very first chapter, Jesus is described as this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth, notice that motif of heavens and earth, were created, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, authorities, all things created for him and by him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There, there, there are probably a number of things going on in, in uh, this part of section of Colossians. Uh, there's perhaps a wisdom motif going on here. But, but clearly, it's, it's hard not to catch the possible connections with Genesis chapter 1. That humanity was originally to be created in God's image to rule over all creation. Now Jesus Christ is portrayed as the true image of God, as the one who himself is God. He now is the true image and reflection and representative of God who rules over all creation. But as its creator, unlike Adam and Eve, who are part of the created order, now Jesus Christ rules over creation and is sovereign over creation as its creator. So the, the, the theme of image of God emerges here. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verses 18 and 19, to, to further connect Jesus with, with Adam and uh, Adam's uh, the, the original intention of God for, for his humanity. In chapter 5 and starting at verse 12 through 18, I won't read the whole section, but uh, we find an extended comparison between Adam and Christ. What, what Adam failed to do, and, and oh, in fact the effects of his sin and creation, now Jesus as the new Adam and the new head of, uh, of humanity and creation comes to to uh, fix in reverse in a sense. So verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all sin. Sin was indeed in the world because before the law, uh, or was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not yet reckoned where there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who is to come, Jesus Christ. And the rest of the section then compares the effects of Adam's one sin with the effects of Jesus' act of righteousness, probably his, his death on the cross. So that, that Jesus is clearly seen as, as a new Adam, is fulfilling God's intention for humanity that Adam failed to do, now is carried out through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the new humanity and the righteousness that he will establish uh, over uh, over all things. Notice too within that uh, within that description in in Romans chapter five, uh, even within the description of what Christ does, is notice a couple times you have this theme of of uh, uh, of dominion or ruling. So verse verse seventeen: If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through the one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Uh, so there, there are several facets of that comparison between Christ and Adam that clearly take you back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Jesus Christ now is the true Adam who in the, to bring in uh, the, the, the text from Colossians as well, who in the image of God now restores the rule of God and God's glory and now restores his people in a new creation, in a new humanity, reversing what Adam did, bringing to fulfillment God's intention for humanity, which, which Adam failed at. But not only is this realized in Christ, 
but it's also realized in God's people. So, for example, in the same book, Colossians, following the mention of Jesus as the image of God, intriguingly, later on in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul describes this, and, and he, we've clothed, you've clothed yourselves with the new self, the, literally the new man or new humanity, that replaces the, the, the original humanity, going back to Adam, you have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator, which clearly evokes Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So notice what, what I think partly is going on is, by virtue of belonging to Christ, the true image of God, now God's people also are being renewed in God's image restoring God's original intention for humanity, that God's image bearers would uh, fill the earth with his glory and and with his rules, uh, represent God's rule throughout all creation. That is now beginning to be fulfilled as God's people put off the old self and put on the new self, who they are in Christ, this new humanity, which is being renewed in the image of its creator, Genesis 1 and 2. In Ephesians 2, one other text related to the kingship theme. In Ephesians 2, the author is also clear that following on the heels of chapter 1, the text we just looked at, where Jesus Christ is raised and seated at the right hand of God and has dominion over all things. Now notice what Paul says in chapter 2 of Ephesians. If I can skip down to verse 5 and 6. Even though you were dead, even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. What Paul is saying is basically what what has happened to Christ in chapter 1 by virtue of his exaltation in fulfillment of the intention for creation of subjecting all things under his feet and at the right hand of God, fulfilling God's intention for a vice regent to rule over all creation in fulfillment of Genesis 1 and 2. Now God's people participate in that by virtue of being in Christ, who is exalted to heaven and who who reigns over all things. Christians also begin to fulfill the original mandate of creation for God's people to rule, reflect God's image and to rule over all creation. So uh, Paul is clearly aware of uh, both Davidic king, kingdom, uh, Jesus as the fulfillment of the promises of David of a vice regent uh, ruling over Israel and eventually ruling over creation. But, but Paul also goes all the way back to creation and sees both Christ and his people as ultimately fulfilling God's intention for his people to subdue and have dominion over all of creation. And they do that through the vice regent, Jesus Christ, the son of David, and by being united with him, being incorporated into Christ. The fourth theme, a temple dwelling of God, is uh, Paul also draws on the Old Testament theme of the restoration and rebuilding of God's temple as the place where God dwells with his people. Although the uh, kind of the, uh, the caveat is Paul does not see this realized in the physical building of a, of a, a stone structure or any other kind of structure. Instead, consistently in Paul, temple language gets applied to the people themselves. The people themselves make up this temple where God, through His Holy Spirit, His new covenant spirit, now takes up residence. His presence comes to rest on the people of God. Perhaps perhaps this is how we should understand language such as this. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says in verse uh, verse 18, the text that we're, most of us are aware of, Paul says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Perhaps we are to understand this in terms of God's presence filling the temple. The, the language here does resemble uh, uh, the, the, the Old Testament notion of God's presence 
through now through his spirit, coming to fill his temple. Now God's people are seen as a temple that God's presence fills. And therefore, they're to live appropriately as the commands in the rest of this section of Ephesians 5 spell out. But, but to suggest that that may be the way we should read it, go back to chapter 2. And we cut off uh, earlier, we cut off the last couple of verses, but I want to return to them. Starting with verse 19 through 22 of, he, of Ephesians chapter 2. So then you, Gentiles, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God along with Israel. So now notice the building household imagery that, the, that, that Paul applies to the people. But notice how he's going to shift and merge subtly into temple imagery. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Again, there's the foundation, the 12 apostles, the foundation of the true people of God, with Jesus himself as this cornerstone. In him, Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, in this temple, you also are, or in whom, I'm sorry, in Christ, you, this temple, you, the people, are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place of God or for God. I think that's better interpreted. You are uh, being built together into a dwelling place where God lives by his spirit. So clearly, Paul sees the church as the temple of God, the, the temple in fulfillment of Ezekiel, and other Old Testament texts, yes, the temple has been restored. Israel has been restored, a Davidic king ruling over them uh, in a new covenant relationship. And now God's temple also has been restored through God dwelling in the midst of his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 is the other classic text where Paul uh, says to the Corinthians, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Same concept that we read about, just read in Ephesians chapter 2. This may also be reflected back in verse 12. Now, if anyone builds in the foundation of gold, silver, and precious stones, which are su suggestive of the restoration of the temple from the Old Testament. So, so clearly, Paul conceives of the people of God as the, the rebuilt and restored temple, the place where God now takes up residence with his people. But now the, the building blocks and the stones that make up the temple are no longer made of granite or whatever, but now they are consist of the people themselves. The people are the true temple uh, where God now dwells. This may express why in the rest of 1 Corinthians, Paul is so keen on the purity of the people because they are the temple. So Paul takes the purity concept and language from, from Old Testament and now applies it more broadly to the, the people themselves, the church, because it is now the true temple. The last theme, creation and land. I would suggest that this language or the, the, the theme of land and creation, including new creation. Remember we said at least Isaiah anticipates that, that the, the final restoration of Israel to the land will, will take place in terms of a, a new creation, something that transcends just Israel returning to, to the promised land. But we, we see a lot of language that, that is reminiscent of the land so that I think, again, Paul sees ultimately... Paul sees the, the promise of a land and creation fulfilled initially in the blessings of salvation that now God provides for his people. We saw in the Gospels that uh, the land could be seen in terms of, of entering the kingdom. It's interesting, Jesus himself talks about inheriting the kingdom of God. Inheritance was a term used in the Old Testament of Israel inheriting the land. Now Jesus conceives of them inheriting the kingdom of God. That inheritance language gets picked up in Paul as well. So for example, uh, to give you one example, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, he says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise Notice that language of heir. And then, and then verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, my point is this, heirs. Uh, as, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, 
But then Paul's point is, but now they are no longer slaves. So because they are in Christ, they are heirs according to the promise. Interestingly, that, that, that inheritance language in, in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, is tied in with the promise made to Abraham. Here in, in, in 3.29, you are Abraham's offspring. What was promised to Abraham's offspring? They were promised the land. God would give them the land forever. They would inherit the land. Now God's people are seen as inheriting the promise of salvation, uh, the Holy Spirit in Galatians. So that I take it that inheriting the kingdom, inheriting uh, the blessings of salvation are seen as the initial fulfillment of the land that was promised to Israel. Though, again, we're going to see this this isn't all the New Testament has to say uh, about the theme of land and creation. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 and 22 through 23, which I don't want to read through the whole thing, but this is the uh, 22 through uh, 25, uh, uh, 22 through 23, all the way through 25 actually, is the, the fruits of the Spirit text. But, but most likely when Paul says the fruits of the Spirit are these things, it is, again, I wonder if the language of fruitfulness is not meant to indicate the fruits of the new creation. The, the, this theme of fruitfulness back in Genesis 1 and 2 that crops up again in the prophets when God's people are restored in the new creation. Uh, you find all this language of fruitfulness cropping up. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, but, Perhaps that is lies behind is what lies behind Paul's thought here. When he talks about Christians producing the fruit of the Spirit, they are producing the fruit of the new creation. The promise of land and new creation and Israel's restoration to the land is now fulfilled in God's people bearing the fruit of the new creation, which is pursuing things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gen- generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and a host of other things as well. But uh, note, though, how many times Paul does, though, specifically allude to new creation text. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. In 5.17, Paul says, uh, uh, So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Behold, everything has passed away, and see, everything has become new. That language comes right out of Isaiah chapter 65. So that, in a couple other places on Isaiah as well, that anticipate a new creation. So, again, what Paul is saying is, uh, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The, the emphasis is not so much that you have been created anew and you have a new heart and, and uh, you're a new human being compared to what you are. But I, I wonder if we shouldn't so much understand this in, in personal terms, which is part of it, but, but more widespread in terms of the fulfillment of the new creation. In Christ... The new creation has arrived. By being in Christ, we participate in this new creation. So that Isaiah's new creation, that is the ultimate fulfillment of God's intention for the land and creation back in Genesis 1 and 2, has now arrived and been inaugurated in the person of Jesus Christ. The, the same, the, the creation language is probably to be understood as lying behind a text that most of us are familiar with in Ephesians chapter 2. When Paul says, uh, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now look at 10. For, for we are his workmanship or what he has made, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice again the creation language. So that what I think Paul again is saying is the, the, the promise of a new creation is now fulfilled in God's people who are a new creation and enabled to produce the fruits of the new creation. And I, I think if we explore more clearly, Paul, Paul links clearly links new creation with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the new creation has been inaugurated. The, 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 the promise of the land given to Israel in fulfillment of the, the creation now is fulfilled in the promises of salvation that we inherit and the new creation that has been now inaugurated in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Now, most of these that we've, all, all of these virtually that we've looked at have focused on the realized aspect of, of eschatology or the realized aspect of the story. But there are several hints of unrealized aspects or the not yet, the consummation, the, the, the consummated eschatology. Uh, let me just touch on one of those in conclusion. In chapter 1, verse 10 of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, and I'll back up and read verse 9 as well. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. And here's the mystery that he's revealed. Of, uh, this is God's will. As a plan for the fullness of time to sum up or gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Again, the heavens and the earth reflecting creation language. So that chapter 1 and verse 10 is Paul's articulation of the ultimate purpose of God for the not yet to which the, the rest of Ephesians is pointing is that one day all things in the entire cosmos in heaven and earth will find their rightful place under Christ. All things will be reconciled and restored to God's original intention for creation in Genesis 1 and 2. But as Paul demonstrates, that purpose has already been inaugurated in God reconciling Jew and Gentile into one new humanity, in, 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 in Christ entering into his Davidic rule and subduing all things in creation, and God's people sharing in that rule by virtue of belonging to Christ, and, and in the foundation of the new covenant, the restoration of the people of God, God dwelling with his people, and God establishing the new creation, this, the, 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 God's ultimate intention that will be fulfilled in the realization of his will for all things being summed up in Christ and finding their proper relationship to Christ in fulfillment of Genesis 1 and 2 is now already underway in the person of Christ and those who belong to Christ uh, through faith. Now, in the next section, we'll focus on how these uh, five themes uh, are articulated in and, and continue to surface in uh, some of the other uh, New Testament letters. And then we'll spend a little bit of time to show how ultimately the not yet aspect, the consummated aspect of the story arrives in Revelation 21 and 22, where all these five themes surface in, in that, that finale. This was lecture number five of six by Dr. Dave Mathewson, on the storyline of the Bible. Lecture number five was on the Pauline epistles. 